Hello, and welcome to another session of digital slide review and sign out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel and our program today, part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy. Our case today comes from the realm of GYN pathology. It's an unusual case of a 53-year-old woman who's had some abnormal perimenopausal bleeding and also a little bit of enhancement of uh, androgenic symptoms with some hirsutism. She's found to have a rather bulky 25 centimeter ovarian mass uh, that's felt to be behind these symptoms and that comes to resection. The tumor when it's removed is a mixture of solid and uh, some cystic or watery components as we can see here, a few smaller cystic spaces and there were other large ones around as well. Uh, this tumor has a, a lobulated nodular appearance with variable morphologies and we'll look at several slides of this uh, uh, tumor because it's uh, so uh, unique and interesting. So we'll start over here where we have uh, uh, seen this annotation uh, and go right away to this area where we see we have a mixture of uh, some more stromal uh, loose cells, some more dense stromal cells, and then some cells that are maybe nested or slightly tubular uh, in fashion. Here we see some of these little tubule type structures uh, in and amongst this. And add mixed with this, of course, are a number of cells with somewhat eosinophilic cytoplasm here uh, with generally round nuclei. Um, so we might immediately jump to the thought that perhaps this is a Sertoli Leydig tumor. It has a stromal pattern and it has uh, these mixtures of tubule type cells, tubular cells, uh, and some of the more eosinophilic uh, Leydig like cells. And perhaps even here in one or two of these, we've got a suggestion of a crystalloid of Rinky. Uh, more of these uh, eosinophilic variant cells over here. Um, but the story uh, needs to be examined fully, and in a 25 centimeter tumor, uh, we would be wise to examine it uh, quite carefully, uh, because certainly these can be uh, uh, quite heterogeneous in their appearance. Uh, as we look at this tumor, we see other areas where we have um, maybe a more um, open appearance uh, to some of these tubular structures, a little bit more pale cytoplasm, a more epithelioid appearance to some of these nests or tubules uh, that are present. Uh, here we see some, again, some more nesting, a little bit of cording type of uh, pattern. As we look a little further, we see here Again, a little bit more of this more open pattern uh, with uh, fairly large cells, uh, a moderate amount of uh, pale cytoplasm, and a little bit of a sort of nested or tubular pattern to the architecture, maybe even a little bit of pseudocolumnar cell change in some of these areas. Notice that here we have far fewer of the eosinophilic cells, although there are occasional ones such as this one right here. Uh, that if we are attending to them, we can see them. Notice also here there's a suggestion that some of these cells may begin to have slightly foamy cytoplasm. Um, and that's an important feature to remember uh, as we think about uh, Sertoli uh, and Leydig cells. So let's uh, go to the next area, the next slide. And here we see again uh, a more hemorrhagic area, lobulated, cellular areas, cystic uh, areas. Um, and as we look here, uh, we see this uh, sort of uh, trabecular pattern with uh, little channels and uh, cords of cells um, amidst this hemorrhagic stroma. Um, and here again, the cells have a very uh, round nuclei um, and moderate amounts of cytoplasm almost in a uh, carcinoid tumor type pattern, um, uh, again with very round nuclei. And notice here that we don't see really any uh, suggestion of the eosinophilic cells, although here we can see a few of these foamy cells uh, and maybe one or two cells here on the edge that might be Leydig cells. So you see the Leydig cell component can be quite subtle um, and inobtrusive. Uh, in these areas, and uh, some of the areas may have uh, none at all. 
And then we'll look here at this uh, pattern, to uh, this cell, or this uh, section, to reveal even yet another uh, pattern. Uh, here, this uh, large follicular pattern uh, with large uh, follicle type, type areas and these uh, sheets and nests of cells with really quite abundant pale cytoplasm, uh, some interstitial hemorrhage. And uh, in this situation, virtually no uh, eosinophilic uh, cells of uh, lighted type. But notice that we do see a fair number of mitotic figures in this uh, type of an area. So this looks a little bit different than some of those other areas and raises the possibility that we have another component uh, to this tumor. Uh, do we have an epithelial component? Do we have another type of sex cord uh, tumor uh, that is present here? Uh, this with very abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm, mitotic activity, and round nuclei. Uh, so although it's a small component, it's a potentially not an insignificant one uh, if we're thinking about other components. Uh, now here's another area sort of uh, similar. Um, in some ways, we've got a little bit of a sort of pseudo-follicle formation here. But notice that here uh, we do have some uh, eosinophilic cells associated here uh, that could be lytic cells uh, in the stroma uh, of this uh, lesion. Um, and so uh, maybe there's a little bit of overlap between uh, that area we just looked at and areas like this. Um, and then we see here a, uh, another area of more of the intermediate or, or uh, less well differentiated uh, Sertoli Leidig component uh, with a little bit of almost sarcomatoid type stroma, uh, very poorly formed tubules, uh, very rare or uh, maybe indistinct uh, lighty type, type cells uh, with this uh, compressed spindle-shaped uh, stroma in between uh, these uh, more epithelioid um, and uh, nested areas. So uh, a variety of patterns in this uh, that would be uh, quite confusing um, if we had not uh, been fortunate to detect uh, those uh, lighting cells in the area we first looked at. So I, I show this to uh, reinforce the need to uh, get lots of sections and to be fairly vigorous in examining the different uh, uh, types of areas, such as this more mixoid area and other areas, to see if there are uh, heterologous elements, to see if there are is a second component of uh, tumor cells uh, that we're dealing with uh, in one of these lesions, because those uh, are all known to occur uh, with sex cord stromal tumors. So uh, certainly so far we have identified um, some of the possible causes uh, for this patient to have an androgenic hormonal effect. Uh, just to reiterate what those are, uh, hirsutism, this patient had acne or oily skin, alopecia, uh, insulin resistance, uh, acanthosis, nigricans, blood pressure changes, and obesity. Um, uh, genital uh, changes, vocal changes in the tenor of the voice, those can all represent an abnormality of uh, hyperandrogenism in a uh, woman uh, and uh, should be symptoms that would raise the possibility that the tumor is producing some androgenic effect. Well, in the Sertoli Leidig cell tumor, of course, as we've reviewed before, this is a uh, uh, sort of uh, bimorphic or dimorphic uh, tumor with uh, both sex cord elements as well as uh, hormonal elements, and it may have heterologous elements uh, uh, that is associated in many cases with a DICER-1 mutation. So that's very straightforward, uh, although the morphology can be quite challenging and uh, complex, um, such as we've seen. Um, now, in addition, uh, you know, in this particular case, uh, I think we have areas such as uh, these large areas where we don't have uh, evidence of uh, lighting cells. And an area like this might be termed uh, sex cord stromal tumor not otherwise specified, or we might classify it as a pure Sertoli tumor uh, in areas of this sort without uh, lighting cells. However, if we find rare lighting cells in uh, areas such as this, uh, we can term it a sex cord uh, 
lipidemia is a Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. We don't have to have a certain fixed percentage of Leydig cells in order to qualify in that category because we know those tumors have a variable differentiation, um, as we've talked about before. Um, the concern, however, is that that, that second type of tumor uh, that we may see in a mixed sex cord stromal tumor uh, can be a granulosa cell tumor, either adult or juvenile type. Um, and in this particular case, uh, there were elements uh, that had that suggestion, such as uh, see, we see here. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's always challenging to uh, qualify and, and quantify these sorts of lesions. Uh, of note, uh, this was a slide that was labeled, you know, as having juvenile granulosa cell tumor. Uh, and I think they were perhaps referring to an area like this, where we have this sort of uh, follicular pattern and sort of interstitial wavy cells. It looks quite, uh, uh, quite uh, uh, juvenile granulosa cell-ish like. Uh, with all of these follicular spaces. However, you know, if we come into higher magnification in an area like this, ta-da, what do we see? These are lighting cells. And so while uh, uh, some of the observers uh, on this particular case, which came to us from outside the, our institution, thought this was juvenile granulosa cell tumor, in fact, it still had in large areas, areas of uh, lighting cells that would qualify it nicely as a uh, intermediate grade uh, Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. So uh, we've mentioned juvenile granulosa cell tumor, those large areas with uh, sheets and large follicles, abundant cytoplasm without Leydig cells, those would qualify as ju juvenile granulosa cell tumor. Now, while typically that's in a younger adult, um, it can occur in uh, older adults as well. And uh, of course, these gross features that we think of uh, in terms of uh, large follicular spaces and so forth uh, will be variable when they're mixed up with another sex cord stromal tumor, such as juvenile as a Sertoli Leydig cell tumor. Um, immunohistochemistry may help us, um, although both of these lesions will be positive for almost all of the uh, sex cord stromal markers um, with some variability. Uh, and I'll show you a couple of those uh, in this particular case uh, as well. Uh, and, and this is an area where finding variability may help us to identify and uh, certify different areas as being uh, divergent. Um, so for example, here is a uh, CD56 stain uh, on one of those sections I showed you earlier. And we see that really virtually all of the uh, uh, tumor stains with this marker. Uh, and as we come into higher magnification, we see that it's, it's staining nicely the tubular elements, these corded elements, and less so the interstitial cells. So this may not stain uh, the steroid hormone cells, the lytic component, uh, if they're present uh, in a particular area in abundance, uh, but certainly does stain nicely the Sertoli uh, elements of this tumor. Uh, likewise, WT1, uh, this is a very weak uh, but positive uh, stain, as we see here in some areas, uh, we're getting uh, some nice nuclear staining of uh, many of these areas. And again, a slight differential between the uh, Sertoli uh, component and the uh, stromal component in between uh, these areas. Um, highlighting the vessels here also, interestingly. Now, if we look at another marker, CD99, well, here on this same section, we see that there is quite a bit of differential expression. Uh, and we have nice uh, positive expression over here in this component, uh, but virtually no expression here uh, in this component. And so sometimes this kind of uh, pattern can give us a clue that uh, there is some heteromorphism uh, or perhaps some divergent differentiation or whatever you want to term you want to use it. Uh, to qualify the tumor as being a mixed sex cord stromal tumor. Now, the particular mixed sex cord stromal tumor that we're dealing with here uh, is uh, what's been termed a gynandroblastoma. Um, and this is a mixed tumor that has evidence of sex hormone production and typically includes Sertoli Leydig cell tumor plus some component of granulosa cell tumor, uh, that each of which would account for 10% or more of the tumor. 
Now, could you have a sex cord stromal tumor NOS and Sertoli lighting cell tumor as well? I think that's possible. And I think in this case, we've got a little bit of that. We actually have uh, Sertoli lighting tumor, granulosa cell, and some not otherwise specified stromal tumor. Now, while these are usually young adult patients, as we see in our patient, uh, an older adult can uh, have this type of presentation. Again, the behavior in these is not going to be particularly different than that for either one of these tumors individually. Um, and uh, so uh, behavior according to stage uh, and grade of the tumor uh, may be useful in the, in the Sertoli lighting tumor component. Well, thank you for wading through that uh, case with me. There's a few more digital slides on the pre presentation. I'll put links to that to you. Uh, we estimated here that there was 75% Sertoli lighting tumor and no more than 25% juvenile granulosa cell tumor or sex cord stromal tumor NOS uh, in this particular case. And in general, you should report the percentages of each that you identify, although obviously that can be uh, quite subjective and uh, subject to uh, variability between observers. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that case. Uh, certainly a very stimulating and challenging one. A great one to review all the different patterns for Sertoli lighting cell tumor and differential considerations with other uh, sex cord stromal tumors. Uh, please subscribe so that you'll be able to catch uh, future releases. Uh, we like it uh, when we have subs subscribers who are uh, following regularly the things that we release. And of course, we love your comments. So please uh, uh, share your thoughts and uh, suggestions for things you'd like to see, uh, either directly on the uh, site below or here at uh, my email or uh, Twitter handle. So until next time, thanks so much for joining us.